Okay, it was so good to have you. Well, thank you. You're 90 year old. Young. Young. Yeah, yeah, Very yeah, good. Yeah. My mother is 100, so you're a really young girl. Yeah, yeah. I don't feel old at all. You don't feel old no, at all. No, no. But uh, earlier we decided that everybody here know about Anne Frank. And you are one month older than Anne, right? Correct. And from your 11th year, you moved to Amsterdam and you live together. Opposite each yeah. other. You play together. You're a playmate. Together, yes. Right. School friends. School friends. Yeah. Is she very different from you? Yes, very different. Because I was a tomboy. I like to be wild. Um, I played uh, soccer and uh, rugby and all those different things. And I did tricks on the bicycle with the boys. Oh, gosh. And I was doing acrobats and all these kind of things. And Anne was more a sophisticated little lady, very interested in her dresses and her hairstyle, but as well in boys, with 11 years old. She was already a big flirt. And um, when I told her I had an older brother, she said, oh, when can I come and meet him? Oh, gosh. Um, but, you know, he wasn't interested in a little girl the age of his baby sister. I was his baby sister, so we were only three years apart. Um, so nothing came of that. But, um, you know, I met the family and they came from Germany. I came from Austria, so I didn't speak Dutch yet. And so I met her father, Otto Frank, who later became my stepfather. And uh, he spoke German with me, which was a great help at the time. And um, yeah, so for Unfortunately, not very long because we came to Amsterdam in 1940 and in 1942 um, when the Nazis had occupied Holland, we had to go into hiding. And so I never ever saw Anna anymore. So, so we were together both, for about two, three years. Yeah, two years. Two years. Do you know that he kept, she kept a diary? Yes, I knew that she got it actually on her birthday her 13th birthday, just um, a few weeks before the family went into hiding. So that was very lucky because, because otherwise she would never have written it. So it was for her 13th birthday, Otto bought it her at the bookshop, which is around the corner where we used to live. Father and bought this, the daughter. This bookshop has become very, very famous because um, all the tourists who come to Holland go in this bookshop and the man who owned it didn't know, um, well, at the time he owned it, but it was a new owner. Why do all those tourists come in my bookshop from all over the world? And it turned out that they knew that the diary was bought there. And so now this bookshop owner has made a statue on the square where we lived of Anne Frank and, um, and to memory on Anne and um, when I went the first time to see that, to visit there, I said to him, yeah, it's very nice you've done that, but in this area there lived many, many, many Jewish children, and most of them haven't survived and haven't returned. So you should really put on the plaque, not just Anne Frank, but for all the Jewish children who lived there. So he said, yeah, but she didn't buy a diary in my shop. So he didn't want to know. Um, but did he know that you know Anne? Yes, I told him. I told him. Okay. Yeah. So was she a very literary person? Uh, the 13 year old is very young, you know, to be writing daily diaries and so forth. Well, um, when you read the diary, um, she actually rewrote it. She rewrote it herself. Because after a year in hiding, there was a radio program from a British minister who said it is very important that people write diaries because so we know what has happened in that time. So after a year having written her diary, she rewrote it for publication. But she did? She did herself. Before she died? Um, before she died, yeah. She was two years in hiding, but she wrote it after one year. Rewrote, rewrote them, copied Yeah, them. not the whole book because she yeah. hadn't finished it yet. But what she had written, she found that it was too childish, which it was, of course. But so when she was a year older and has been a year in hiding, um, she had already matured quite a bit. And so she rewrote that.
But um, later on, after Otto died, the Dutch, the Otto left the diary to the Dutch government. That was 1980. Yeah. When the so, father of Anne Frank and your stepfather died in 1980. Yeah, in his will, he left the diary to the government because it, the Dutch government will always exist. But if you leave it to anybody, they might not look after it properly. And the Dutch government decided they would publish the first edition as well, but Anne wrote first. And so it's a very big book. And it is actually, there are not so many copies made because it's for people to want to study her writing. They can compare the different versions. When you read it, did anything surprise you? Um, or what surprised you the most? Well, uh, I knew Otto by then already. Um, so he wasn't yet mar uh, married to my mother. But um, he came to our house. He supported me very much. I was very, very depressed when I came back, when I heard I'd lost my father and my brother. And I was full of hatred, not only against the German people, but the whole world. Because the trouble was that um, in 19, um, when the Germans invaded Europe, that um, the world didn't want any Jewish refugees. So if the world had taken in more people, the Holocaust would never have happened. Canada even wrote as a book, um, one is too many. They really didn't want any Jewish refugees. Why do they? I don't know. And you know, Jewish people have always left different countries. And um, in the, when the persecution in Poland, there was always anti-Semitism in Poland or in Russia or in um, in France or in Germany even, in the, in the early Middle Ages, but it was never, of course, anything like the Holocaust. Do you think uh, that that it can return? Could it come back, such hatred? We do see anti-Semitism in many parts of the world today. Unfortunately, people are starting to be worried again, but personally, I say it's not comparable to anything of the Holocaust, the hatred, and the planning of Hitler. They went, uh, there was a big conference of all the Nazis, and they decided how is the cheapest, the quickest way of killing the whole, the whole Jewish population in Europe. And they succeeded in parts, of course. And six but million. this has never, ever happened anything like that. There were always local anti-Semitism, and this is what it is now as well. So I don't think ever anything like this ha happen again. But we have to talk about it. We have to teach you, the young people, how those terrible things can happen if we are not careful. OK. Uh, you were full of hatred after two years, a year and a half, about a year of imprisonment, and almost died. What healed you? Um, it took is a it lot. time? Um, what well, is time helped, of course. Time helped that I um, got married, that I had a family. But it is, was as well, I realized in the early years after the war, people had changed. People had all suffered. The whole of Europe was, and Asia as well. So there were terrible, terrible things. Um, not just six million people have died, but uh, 40 million Russians, uh, millions of Germans who are bombarding British people, innocent people living in the home were bombarded and killed. Children were, were murdered. Um, in Asia, um, in uh, prison, prison comes from the Japanese, um, millions of people were murdered. You know, it was a terrible, terrible time, and people wanted to have peace, a calm, and change the world. So there were the flower people, um, all living in hope and so on. And, um, you know, there, there was a good attitude. And I met some wonderful people. Um, I didn't speak about my experience for 40 years. It was, Why? Um, at first, I wanted to speak, but people didn't want to hear. They said, we have all suffered. Let's just move on. 
So we suppressed it that not just we, you will hear that from all the Holocaust survivors. Um, they were not, nobody wanted to hear horror stories. And then after 10, 20, 30 years, when people started to ask, we were not ready anymore. We had suppressed it and we said that it's our secret, we have to cope with it ourselves. Right. So, but this was difficult. What made you eventually come out after 40 years not talking about it? Um, well, it was a, a funny coincidence. Um, in Amsterdam, anybody of you been in Amsterdam to the Anne Frank House? Um, a few people. It's a beautiful city, and the hiding place has become a museum. They get more than a million visitors every year. People. Um, it's the first thing, um, as you get a list what to see in Amsterdam, the first thing is the Anne Frank House. Many people go there not having an idea what the Anne Frank House is, so they learn about it through going through the house. And um, um, that was the question. <laughs> <laughs> what made you come out yeah. and talk and, about um, it? So uh, there were um, uh, academics working there, studying the Holocaust as well and everything. And they decided not everybody can come to Amsterdam. So they made, uh, started to make a traveling exhibition with the life of Anne and the rise of, rise of Nazism and so on. And uh, the first exhibition came to London, where I was living at the time. Um, it was in 1986. So 41 years after wow. we were liberated. And um, this exhibition... Um, you were 57 at the time. Yeah, that's right. And um, Otto had died already, but my mother was there with, with us, staying with us at the time. And of course, we were invited to attend. And there were um, not quite as many people as now, but about 200 people. And there was a, a table like this at top, a, a platform with a table. And there were many people sitting who were going to talk about the importance of learning about this event and studying it and so on. And um, the organizer said, come and sit with us at the head table. So I sat up here on the platform and um, I just listened. I was still very shy. I'd never spoken, not only about the Holocaust, but if two people were together, I didn't dare to open my mouth. I can't believe it. You can't it. believe that. No, I can't believe it either. But <laughs> honestly, you know. And um, so everybody spoke. There was as well somebody, forgotten his name, who was um, about, uh, there were movement about stopping the atom bomb at the time as well. A very wonderful man spoke as well about the danger and for the young people to protest about it, which there were a lot of protests that changed themselves on the gates and things like that. And then suddenly the organizer said, and now Eva we want to tell you something. Oh. I said, no, no, nothing. And I wanted to hide under the table, but I couldn't do that. I was an adult after all. So, and, um, so I got up and I had no idea. It was all in my head, but how do I start telling? this horrible, horrible story. And everybody looked up and looked up and I was silent. And then suddenly, everything which I had suppressed for 40 years came flooding out. Um, it was unbelievable. It was an unbelievable relief for me that I've relief. spoken, I have spoken. Right, Eva, did you ever tell your children about uh, what you went through? No. Never. Even, Even before, today? Not until 1987. Well, and then um, people said um, this, travel, this exhibition traveled to the whole of England and Scotland, and they always asked me to say something and open it. So I wasn't a public speaker. I was, as I say, I was very shy. You're doing and very so, well now. Yeah, now I've learned. Well, I'm a bit older too. And, uh, and I asked my husband to write a speech which I read very badly because I was so nervous. I always had to take a tranquilizer before I did this. But eventually I found my own voice. And then people said, you have such an interesting story as well. You should write a book. And I did, and that was Eva's story. And you know, I had nightmares till I spoke. I always dreamt about terrible events that had happened. But once it was 
op in the open and had written about it, I could let go. And that was really very, very important for my whole being. You know, I started to be a person who I really wanted to be. Would so, you advise that other people who have gone through traumatic experiences that should have the right, uh, right a moment to express it? Well, people have realized now. When I speak in America, which I do an awful lot, the first question I usually get, um, so when you came back, did you have counseling? And I said, no, because in that time, first of all, we didn't have the money. Secondly, it wasn't done. And um, no, that was just not known at the time. Now in America, practically everybody I meet says they have been or they still go counseling. And I must admit, my grandchildren all go counseling. <laughs> and I'm very much amazed. I said, why? You have a good life. What is your problem? Oh, you don't know, Omar. You don't know. I have such <laughs> problems. <laughs> and you tell them, oh, you don't know what grandma knows. Yeah, hello, hello. But you <laughs> The world has changed. You know, people, but the soldiers who come from war zones, Afghanistan and so on, they can't they have experienced, or even from Vietnam, the, um, the veterans who have suffered so much, who had done terrible things which they didn't want to do, um, they have counseling now, and they, they need it. Just wonder, just for you, if you're wondering how come she calls her Anna. Her real name is Anna Frank. Anna. At Anna, least the father Anna. calls her Anna. Anna, yeah. yeah. Anna, Annelise is really the full name. But she was always called Anne. Anna. That's a German. But in German the English name. when in Anne. the English in way English we just Anne, Anne Frank. Yeah, that's right. You know, Eva, you talk a lot so far about uh, Anna, about Anne Frank, and uh, I think everybody knows about Anne Frank. But during your visit this time, we've also learned about another very sp special person, and that's your brother Heinz. And could you share a little bit about your brother Heinz so that uh, more people can know his story? Mm -hmm. The yes. one who was not interested in Anne. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, he was my older brother called Heinz Felix. Felix is a Latin meaning happy. Um, he was a very happy young boy. Um, my grandfather three was... Three years a, older than you. Three years older than me. My grandfather was an amateur pianist. And when my brother was four years old, he took him already on his lap, and I showed him how to play piano with two fingers. And my brother, was six years old, took to the piano as if he was born to it. And he started to play um, amazing. He had the perfect ear. Um, later in Holland, he had played in the, in the uh, furnished apartment where we lived. There was a piano. When he was 16 years old, he could play the Rhapsody in Blue from Gershwin by heart, a very difficult piece of music. He composed. Um, he, he had all kind of talents. Um, I was more a wild person. He was very, very gentle. He was a big, big reader. Um, he taught himself in hiding later um, four languages besides German, Dutch, French, he taught himself Spanish and Italian. And um, in hiding, of course, um, you couldn't make music, he had to be quiet, so he started to paint. And he created some amazing artwork, um, which was all fantasy. Um, still lives first, he tried to get the material with glass and, and velvet and copper. But then he made scenes with people on it, all just fantasy. And before they were arrested, they hid the paintings under the floorboard of that house. And um, in the cattle truck, when we were transported to Auschwitz, because we were all betrayed, um, he told me he hid the paintings with a note on it. This belongs to Heinz and Eric Geiringer. And after the war, is coming to pick it up again. So, if you survive. So, well, he was going to another safe place, never expecting that he wouldn't survive. Unfortunately, we were betrayed, and he didn't make it. Have you and, found the paintings now? And 
um, when my mother and me returned, and especially after Otto got the diary of Anne, which sort of saved his sanity, because he was uh, 57 years old when he heard that his whole family had perished. And um, when he told us the news and he left us, um, my mother and me, how can this man carry on in his life? He has nothing really to live for. And then he got the diary, and that gave him something to think about and to do. And he was so proud of it. He showed it to everybody. A diary is a very personal book, you know? And he wasn't sure if he wanted to share it with the world. It was his book, Anna had left it. But he, was, he showed it off to everybody. And people said, it is your duty to publish this. It's really a work of literature. And that was true. So in Holland, when it was published, he had difficulty finding a publisher. But eventually, it was a publisher who, Catholic publisher. And Anne wrote as well about her flirtation with the, the young boy who was hiding there, and about her sexual development, which at that time, was something you didn't talk about, so he had to take it out. So it was not so original. But then was later. Was it later add back? Yeah, yeah, later it was all put back again. Because now sex is something everybody talks about. It. There's no, 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 no scruple about talking about all those things now. Are you but, giving the students some idea? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the world has really changed. To give a kiss to a boy you didn't really know, that was not something you were doing. And she writes, the mother of Peter was very upset that she was flirting with her son. You know, you have to wait till you're married. So, um, but things have changed, of course. So um, Otto published it, of course, and um, in 70 languages. And um, like, I go everywhere in the world, I mention the name of Anne Frank, and everybody knows who she is. And so my task is still left in life, and I'm succeeding already quite nicely to make Heinz, my brother, as well, who was, he was not quite 18 when he was murdered by the Nazis. And nobody really, very often, my mother and me said, well, Anne is so well known, she has become immortal. But Heinz, nobody knows about him. So I wrote another book, my second book, called The Promise. Because when Heinz was 12 years old, um, we shared a room in Amsterdam. He said to me, Avery, I'm scared from dying. And um, what will happen when we die? I said, well, I don't know. Let's ask our father, who has all the answers. And in the morning, he went to him. And he said, Papi, what will happen when we die? And my father said, well, yes, everybody has to die. That's a natural thing of life. But um, if you have children, you live on in your children. That's a seed of you will carry on. And then this 12-year-old boy said, what if I die before I have any children? And my father thought a bit, and then he said, well, whatever you have achieved, if it was a short life, somebody will remember, um, somebody will know that you have been on this earth, that you had a life here, even if it was short. You're sure you've said something, you've done something, perhaps a little drawing, and um, so you will not be forgotten. So he had to accept that. And then, of course, when I realized he left a lot behind, wonderful artwork, and as well, a lot of very, very deep thinking poems, um, which I have published, unfortunately, in Dutch, but some of them are being translated now. So my task is still to make his life that people remember that he has been on this earth and that he has, even if it was a short life, still achieved something. And you know the museum in Israel, Yad Vashem, they're trying to find the six million names. And when I was once in, in Russia, I met a man who had come from there, and he said he still goes, it was a few years ago, he still goes into the uh, Russian villages where Jewish people have lived, try to find people who remembered 
the Jewish families who lived there and who remember perhaps the name of them, then they can put them at least on the list in Yad Vashem, so that at least the name of those people is uh, are remembered. What would you do with the artwork of uh, your brother Heinz? Um, well, I donated it to the Resistance Museum, so they made an exhibition. And um, of course, museums have so much material. It's not there all the time, but some paintings are there permanently. And as well, um, we had in America created another exhibition, and um, they're traveling around copies of the paintings. And in South Africa, they made as well an exhibition. And um, 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 another gentleman who... Um, um, Glenn? Glenn? Not this Glenn, but another Glenn um, was impressed with his story. And he has made a copy. So um, you have here now as well a copy. But it is at the moment going to be open after New Year. You, you, you Chinese New Year, and um, I hope it will come to this part of um, Hong Kong as well. And but it's not so far to go to this. Macro okay. Thanks for that, Eva and yeah. Ronnie. One of the things that you know we do in with our center too. We're really mindful that when Eva mentions the number six million, uh, I hope that the students here understand the relevance of that number. Six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust or uh, died unnatural deaths in the Holocaust. And so it's sometimes tough to understand what that number means. Not unnatural uh, uh, unnatural. Uh, unnatural, unnatural. But in Europe, before World War II, the number of Jews that were living in what was Nazi-occupied Europe was only about nine plus million, right? So that would be two out of every three Jews was murdered in the Holocaust. And so what we try to do is we think about, uh, first, there's a, a miracle that we have survivors. We have Eva here uh, to be able to talk with us. We also think about the people that didn't make it. So Anna didn't make it. Heinz didn't make it. We had all these voices, all these people that had so much to bring to the world that were lost. To give you some idea, Hong Kong has 7.4 million people. So 6 million people is what? Roughly 80%? Correct. So one out of five. So if I were to count one, two, three, four, five, four of you will die. Another one, two, three, four, five, four of you will die. That's how many, all of Hong Kong. Right. And the numbers, actually, when you got to what you experienced uh, in Auschwitz, Eva, they were much worse. How many people were still alive in Auschwitz uh, when the Russians came to liberate? About 500. Out of a total of? Of, of it's, uh, tens of well, thousands. Tens of thousands, because um, they were More. taken, a lot of them died, I mean, they were taken from the whole of Europe people uh, were transported to Auschwitz. Uh, Dr. Vaught, I hope you don't mind me asking you, but we have a specialist expert here. My recollection is that the number of people that were sent to Auschwitz is something uh, close to 1.3 million. Would that be correct? More. I'm sorry. Yeah, 1.3 so in Auschwitz alone. Just Auschwitz, the so one camp. And over, over 300 death camps in Germany and Poland. 300. So you can imagine the odds of being able to survive were so, so low. I just have two questions, and then I will invite the other three student moderators to join me. Number one, can you tell who has a better chance of surviving? Is it, is it physical stamina? Is it psychological uh, strength? What is it then? Well, the interesting thing is that in the camps, um, under worse conditions than the men were, more women have survived. So, I mean, that's a fact. The women in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, Birkenau was a women's camp, was, the conditions were much, much, much worse. In the women's camp? In the women's camp. And nevertheless, more women survived than men. Um, that's interesting, really. Right. So, and um, they say because we are used to 
suffering more than men through giving birth, through pain. Um, I don't know, that's not the only thing. I think we just have, well, I don't know, we, we seem to be stronger. History it's, shows it's that. It's a fact, it's a fact. It's, it's a not fact. Just, it's I right. made up, it is, they made statistic about that. Right. And not just in Auschwitz, but in all the camps, the proportion where more women survive. What about personality? Does it come into the picture? People who are spunky, boy, boyish, uh, tend to survive better, uh, or what? Um, we're somehow tougher. I don't tougher. know. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yep. Uh, one other thing, Eva, that you've spoken about, and I, we've had other survivors say, there's another aspect of survival that is really at the top of the list, which is luck, right? Uh, yeah, of course, as well, as well. A lot of luck. To mi little miracles happened. Can you tell about the story, and then I'll invite the three students to come up, about your mother? Your mother, it's half luck and half brain, I suppose, that caused her to survive. Um, well, it was part luck, part she had been um, once selected, you know, there were an arrival, of course, there was immediately a selection, meaning that no children, no older people um, were going into the camps. They were at arrival already, uh, separated and guessed immediately at arrival. So the older ones and the younger ones and the weaker ones Immediately guessed. Well, weaker ones who didn't know yet who was yeah, weaker. Okay. But uh, age, young ones and older ones were taken away. And then, um, while we were working, of course, and we were starving to death, people became weak, we were not able to work anymore. So from, um, I would say, every month there were selections, naked, you had to parade in front of the camp doctor who decided who was going to die and to live. And at one of those selections, um, I passed. We had to turn around naked in front of this doctor called Mengele. And my mother followed me, and she was selected with 40 of our Dutch transport at the time to be taken out naked and go to the gas chambers. And I had thought, of course, I'd lost my mother. But again, through a miracle, she was saved, and we were reunited again. Wanted, so, really. Glenn, you want to quickly tell the story why she survived? Well, Twice? Uh, well, Sorry. first, uh, I, so on this story, my understanding of uh, this is that uh, your a relative, and this is uh, somewhat complex, but a relative from back in the days when uh, Eva was in Austria was actually uh, there working with this infamous Dr. Mengele and uh, convinced this doctor uh, that out of the 40 women taken, uh, that uh, Eva's mother should not be gassed. And it was only much later that she found out about this. Um, we talk about miracles, and before we get to the next section, Ronnie, I think there's one other uh, remarkable thing that happened with you, Eva, which is when you first got to uh, Auschwitz, and uh, there were the selections of the people that were going to live and, uh, and those who would uh, be going to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to be gassed. And you were selected, not, you were not selected, right? So how did that happen? Because my mother got on transport to the death camp. She got from somebody in the holding camp where we were in Holland um, a coat and a hat. And my mother gave me a this. A coat and a hat. Yeah. And it was a hat with a big rim. And um, it was a bright May day. And this, this hat made a shadow over my face. And so when this Dr. Mengele looked at me, just for a fraction of a minute, um, he thought I was older. He didn't see my young face. So I was still amongst the living. And there were girls from 18 years, 19 years, and they were not particularly tall or looked pale after that horrific journey, were taken away and killed. Okay, can I now invite the three uh, students to join us? 
Uh, first, uh, Billy. Billy used to work for uh, Hong Kong Uni uh, Baptist University, majoring in geography. Worked last summer at the Asia Society. Billy, come on up. Uh, Ivy, Ivy uh, is now working for the Asia Society, so she must right. be the best, All right? And then finally, Harrison. Harrison, you've always been interested in Jewish affairs and Israel and so forth. So please join us. And uh, I will now keep quiet uh, and leave it to uh, the students to uh, ask the questions. Here's your microphone. Who will begin? Ivy? Yes. <laughs> Hi, good evening, Eva. Thank good you evening. for being with us tonight. So I guess to start off, um, I understand this is your first visit to Hong Kong. Um, tell us, how has it been for you? Um, well, I, of course, have heard a lot about Hong Kong, but I didn't really know much. I knew it was um, um, uh, part of, of, of China once, and um, that was about more of all I knew. And I was very anxious because to anybody I said I was going to Hong Kong, they said, oh, how lucky you are. This is beautiful there. You'll be amazed. And it is true. I was um, taken to the hotel and we looked out. We were on the 32nd floor. We have never been so high in a building. And I looked out and I saw the, the hills with, with houses on top there, there's enormous skyscrapers. Um, it, I said to my friends, this is futuristic. I've never imagined a town can look like that. So um, um, I think it's beautiful. And um, I haven't seen too much yet. And um, all the family in, in England who write to me, I hope you have some time for sightseeing as well. We want to hear how our cog is. Well, I haven't had much time yet. Or I was too tired from the jet lag, or I'm busy talking. So, <laughs> it's um, your fault, uh, no, I think it's the last point. Eva's been talking a lot in Hong Kong, and it's great. But I'm just coming over over my jet lag. It's quite a long journey from from London. The time difference is eight hours, so um, it's a bit difficult to sleep and be awake. But I think I'm got over it now. Did you get a chance to try some of the Hong Kong cuisine? Um, Yes, we went to a uh, Oriental or uh, Hong Kong restaurant, and but of course we have a lot of Chinese people in London, and I love to uh, go there and eat duck. <laughs> the best <laughs> duck is in Hong Kong. Yes, we all went to Yum Cha actually uh, on uh, Sunday. We went for dim sum. It was very good. Okay, so shall we move on to the next question? Um. As much as we read about about the Holocaust and the camps, um, what's happened there is um, imaginable to most of us. So could you share more about the day-to-day -day life in the camps? Um, well, um, so you live in, in huge, huge barracks where um, in each barrack are about 500 people. Um, that's a women's camp. I'm not talking about the men. The men's situation was actually quite different. But um, you, sl you sleep in um, big bunks where eight people sleep in three high. Um, you have only one garment. You sleep day and night in the same garment. Um, what is in those, bu in those um, bunks is no blanket, no straw, no pillow, nothing. But what is in it is bed bugs and lice. So within the first day already, you're already covered in lice. Um, not just head lice, but body lice. So um, it's a terrible thing. You scratch the whole time. The bed bugs um, are the size of your thumbnail. They have little legs who cling to your skin and suck your blood. And they're very difficult to get off your body. When you succeed, it leaves a wound which gets, of course, infected. So within days, you scratch, you're full of wounds already. Um, in the morning, when it's still dark, summer and winter, so five o'clock, four o'clock, you get woken up. As I say, eight people sleep in such a, as perhaps, a width of this table. And um, so you have to sleep like spoons. If one turns, you all have to turn. So um, in the dark, you are called out, and there is a roll call. 
the whole camp is being counted, which takes about two hours. It happens very often, practically every day, that, um, of course, not the first week you're at the camp, but people who are longer there, that one of your eight people in the morning doesn't wake up. So this person can't come out to be counted. You don't tell the Nazis, in my bank, somebody has died, so there's one person less to count. No, you're not allowed to speak to them. So the camp is counted, the number doesn't tally, all right, we have to recount. So you stand there for four, four hours sometimes, in any weather. It could pour with rain later when it's freezing cold, you stand there. If you move, you're being beaten. So you have to stand stock still there for two hours minimum. Then you get your breakfast, which is a little mug of some liquid. Um, it could be some soup, it could be some, some leftover sour milk or anything which the Nazis had eaten, anything, as long as it's only liquid with no nourishment whatsoever. Then you were taken to work, usually very, very heavy physical work from morning to late at night without a toilet break, without any food. Um, Even women, women work. That's the women, yeah. Um, but it was not really women's work. It was road building, digging, um, carrying uh, big rocks around, um, physical work, all very, very tough work, um, without a break. In the summer, your head got burned, the ears, because you had shaven heads. Um, in the winter, you were really freezing to death. Um, then in the evening, usually nine o'clock or so, you go back to the barrack, again you stand two hours, roll call, again the camp is being counted. Then you get your supper, which was a big chunk of bread. Day in, day out. There was no Sunday, no holiday. We didn't know what day of the week it was. It was all the same. We didn't even know what month it was, but we, we only recognized the season. No lunch? Um, no lunch. No lunch. No, 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 no lunch. Um, some people, this chunk of bread you got, some people decided in the beginning, well, I eat half in the evening and the rest I keep for the day. But you had nowhere to keep anything. You had no bag, no pockets, you know, the garment had, you couldn't, it was nowhere to keep it. And when you slept, the only place where you keep it was under your head. But not in the beginning when we were there. People wouldn't do that yet. But later when you were so hungry and the people were sleeping next to you and the bread fell out of the head and legs was next to you, your neighbor was eating it away. So you woke up, you think you have a little bit of something for breakfast. No, it was gone. So we realized you have to eat it in the evening and just be hungry the next day. I'm very curious into the day to day. Very often we see from maybe films and we see it the, the kind of uh, routine, the barrack, the instruction kind of narrative. In the day to day, do, do people talk to each other or do they have conversations? How, how, what is the mentality like? Unfortunately, well, where you work, you're certainly not allowed to talk. On a roll call, you're not allowed to talk. And by that time, you are so exhausted you fall into bed that you don't talk. So there was practically no conversation. And you know, we must admit, um, people didn't really look out for each other anymore. People don't You're look just, out for each other? No. Um, the first weeks, yes, but afterwards, you just really try to stay alive. So in the winter, there's no blanket? No. Wow. Germany's pretty cold. And there was no heating. No heating. Well, Poland was very, very cold, very, very cold. And this winter where we were there was actually one of the coldest winter on record. You were caught May 44, and then you stayed there for about until January or February. Well, January, we were liberated. 27th of January will be now a special Holocaust Memorial Day because it's um, 75 years 
that Auschwitz was liberated by the Russians. So that's a very special year for us. It is shocking to know that people stop looking for it, like looking out for each other. And in your case, I understand your mother was with you. Was that relationship still as loving as it was? And what, was that the only thing that kept you going? Um, yes, this Good being question. together with my mother was very, very, very important. Um, we had, some, of course, support from each other. But um, as I said, after my mother was selected and I thought she had been killed, I was on my own. And I must say, I was nearly on the point of giving up. Um, it became extremely cold, but probably December. I lost my shoes running in the snow. I was barefoot. My toes were open. Um, wounds, bl blood was coming out. And one night, um, I felt something tickling. It was a big rat who was trying to suck on my toe, which is not a very good experience, I can tell you. Pretty scary, a big rat. So, um, yeah, um, microphone. Mm, despite the history of the Holocaust, what is your view on Germany right now? What, what, what do you think about you, Germany? What do you feel about Germany? Then or now? Now. Now. Um, well, you know, for years, even if I heard German speaking, so German is my mother tongue, um, I couldn't stand that. Um, I just closed my ears and I went away. I just couldn't, it's a terrible language. So it's not a terrible language. It remembered me always on the Nazis shouting at us. Um, and I didn't want to go to Germany either. And um, there are people who even now say they would never buy a German car or even go on holidays there or nothing to do with German anymore. Um, I was invited to go to Germany. There was an American, the American had occupied Germany um, in the, I think it was in the 90s. Um, there was a play um, about my life and Anna's life, which was performed in England. And the American had in the army bases, they had people who were doing plays with, his, with the soldiers occupied force and they invited me over they were going to do the play to come there and um, I was first reluctant to go and um, but then I thought well it's so long ago um, I'm going to go and see and I met some German people who were working in the American army base and when they saw my tattoo um, they said a boy started to cry and he said can you ever forgive me um, what we did to you. And then I said to him, well, you were not even alive. You are not guilty. It's nothing to do with you. And I realized that Germany had moved on. Um, it wasn't the same people. It wasn't the Nazis. And um, then they asked me to speak in a school. And I did go. And the children were very, very silent, very suppressed in awe of me and um, we had questions and they said as well can you ever forgive our grandparents i said no i don't forgive your grandparents but i don't hate you you are innocent and this is a big difference there are no old nazis anymore there it's a new life it's new people who realize what has happened, it was a terrible, terrible thing, and they are extremely sorry. So um, I have now many friends in Germany. Um, I go there regularly and speak there as well, and I must say I feel very much at home there. And as well, the policy, Angela Merkel is the only person in the whole world who has cared about the millions of refugees who through no, none of their fault have become homeless and lost their home, lost their families, um, especially Syrian um, and Iraqi uh, refugees who the world don't really want to accept 
but Germany has taken in a million of those people. So just um, just looking at your relationship with Germany, I'm also curious to find out your relationship with Austria. So after Anschluss, you were treated very differently by your friends and neighbors. Did you ever go back to visit them? And do you consider, do you still consider yourself Austrian or more so British? Um, well, for many, many years when people ask me, um, where do you come from? I used to say from Holland. Um, I didn't want to say I came, I was Austrian. Um, now the last few years, um, again, you know, again, the Austrians, those Nazis are not around anymore. But my mother would never set foot in Austria. She said, they threw us out, they didn't want us. I'm never ever going to go back there. And I must say, um, when my youngest daughter was a teenager, she wanted to go there to see her roots, where we came from. And I did take her with my husband, we went. And it was for me like a tourist troop. I didn't know anybody, I had no connection to anybody. And I loved the scenery because I grew up in the mountains and the lake. It's a beautiful country. But in Vienna, I must say, I didn't feel at home. I remembered um, where we lived and I felt really uneasy. But I did now, last year, I did a documentary for the Austrian television with somebody and he took me to all the places as well to the death camps where my father was murdered and all that. And I went to the house where the paintings were hidden and I met some very, very wonderful people as well. And again, most of those Austrians were very, very sorry for what has happened. But nevertheless, the policy is um, they don't want any refugees. They haven't really learned enough. And I would certainly, I wouldn't go there back for my pleasure. I wouldn't go and spend a holiday there. I remember um, watching a, a, the play, um, and you mentioned in the video that after the liberation and uh, you didn't have the the change the cash to get on the bus and then to later revisit the house which when you finally got there uh, it was found that it was left untouched it was left exactly what it was like when you got back right. how, how did it feel to be like that it it felt especially at first when i didn't know yet that my father and brother wouldn't come back um it was empty, you know, I felt, where are they? I hope they're coming back soon. But after I heard that they would never come back, I, I couldn't sleep. I had to sleep there, but I told you I had nightmares all the time. And it was really, really very, very unpleasant to live there. But we had no other possibility to go, so we had to stay there. But it was not, not a pleasant experience at all. So, you know, it wasn't just the suffering in the camp, but there was a lot of hardship afterwards to be able to cope with your loss. And not only the loss, but to, um, you know, your, my family has lived in Austria for generations, and um, I felt Austrian before, I, was, I loved the country, and you lose your, your homeland, you lose where you belong to. And, um, I can't understand, no, you know, now is a problem with our Brexit. Um, um, some of my grandchildren and one daughter has taken on um, German nationality because, you know, they say um, with a British passport, you will have difficulty traveling, but with a German, because if your parents or grandparents were Austrian or Germans, you can get their passports, um, this nationality. And I was very shocked when now, when before I left, one of my daughters said, I'm going to get an Austrian passport. I said, what? She said, well, it might be handier. I said, but you know, they threw us out there. But that's what they want to do. I mean, she's over 60 years. I can't tell her anymore what to do. <laughs> you don't like it? But I but don't you... like it. I don't like it. I'm surprised that they haven't got more feelings. He didn't go but, through it. Yeah.
Yeah, no, that's it. So, well, you can ha you can be a German, you can be Austrian, you can be British, but it's true, it's indisputable that your family suffered because you are Jewish. So did the Holocaust change that? Or, well, do you still feel as strongly about your Jewish identity after it? Or did it actually change it for you? No, I feel um, an, an uncle for mine um, emigrated to England in 1938 after the occupation. He was an expert in perspex. It was a forerunner of plastic. And so that's why he got a permit to go into a factory to help them develop this. And I had a son of two years, and it was a small town in the north of England, and he converted to the Anglican um, religion. And my father said, I'm never going to speak to you again. He said, you are born Jew, and just because you are persecuted, you do, don't give up your birth, birth who you are. And I feel as well very, very strong at you. I would never, ever convert or change it. Um, I'm not very religious. I don't keep a lot of things. I go occasionally to synagogue, which I think is wonderful. I enjoy it, but I don't have so much free time. I'm always traveling around. But, um, um, you know, I think we are very, you know, you we mentioned about the six million, but, you know, I, when I speak in a school, we have a lot of Muslims in, in England. And I speak sometimes in Muslim schools. And I tell them, and they always ask me about Palestine and Israel. And I say to them, do you know how many Jews are in the world? They said, yes, um, 200 million. How many Palestinians, how many um, uh, Muslims? A bit more, perhaps 300 million. I know we are 16 million, that's all. In the whole world, that's all we are, 16 million. And we are very, very, uh, education is for us something very, very important. We try to give our children the best education possible. And we have achieved, you know, I think 240 Jewish people got Nobel Prizes. Um, we are very, very uh, keen of in, in medicine, in in architecture, in art, we are we have achieved for this few people, um, writers. Um, we are very, very intellectual people, and um, I'm very, very proud to be a Jew. Just a number for everybody. Expert, correct me if I'm wrong. The Jewish number of Jewish people on Earth before the war, and then after the six million died, perished only about five years ago did they reach the same level as the pre-World War II number? Yeah. Still lower. It's still lower. Still lower today than 1948. 1938. 1938, right? yeah. Okay. Well, well, to replace six billion is a lot of people if you are only, I mean, after the, the where, how many were there left? Eight millions, perhaps, eight, and eight billion Jews. And to replace six billion is difficult for eight million people to do. Well, that's why. Mathematically, we can work that out. <clears throat> okay, if the do you have any more questions, the, the three students before we open to the public. I, I did have I do have a burning question. Um, obviously, uh, in the earlier part of the dialogue, you were talking about you know things have changed um, in terms of the the lighthearted side of things, the flirting and all that. That's things have changed, and in terms of attitudes, societal norms. And in terms of the youth today, um, one part of it is that our, obviously our attention span is shorter, our memory of the past is limited by nature, our interest in the past is limited to the fact that we actually study history or we're in such a course. What do you feel about the youth today in terms of the lack of, if not the lack of, historical literacy and the awareness, the drive to learn about the past? Um, well, history is not such an important subject anymore because there are so many new subjects, including computer uh, science and things like that. There are many of those subjects now, which is, I think it's very dangerous to drop art as well. In many schools now, art is sort of a subject which is um, 
put aside. Um, in America, sometimes schools even don't teach anymore handwriting. Um, I think this is a terrible, terrible thing. Um, this is very important for the mind. It's not just science. Science has a different part of the brain working, but it is the arts uh, which elevate people, I think, in a different way. So um, I hope people will realize that we can't drop those subjects. It is uh, very, very important to learn those things and not just concentrate on digital science and things like that. Um, I can do computer and I do my mobile phone, but when my granddaughter, when I have any problem, my granddaughter helps me and she said, but oh my, I've told you this sign means this. I said, I don't see why this sign, um, three dots means this and this arrow means this. Um, I can't take all this, you know. I, I can make an Instagram account for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is something with some... Uh, you see even toddlers going around with a mobile phone and with uh, um, doing things on the computer. <clears throat> and you know, my daughters went to typewriting classes six months and they still couldn't do blind typewriting. And now those children do typewriting on the computer blind without learning it. I don't understand that. It's, it's you know, with 10 figures. I do it with two figures. Um, <clears throat> Now we do it with two fingers too, two thumbs. <laughs> um, you know, it's a complete different world, but I think um, we have to go back to the old things as well. Languages is important. It's a completely different part of your brain who has to be used as well. Very good. Uh, shall we, uh, Eva, uh, Glenn, open to the uh, audience here. Uh, I in particular encourage the students to raise your hand. If somebody else who doesn't look like a student and a student raise your hand, here at the A Society, the student go first, okay? But the first one, I believe, is may not be a student. Go ahead. Well, I'm the mother of the student. Uh, very good. Please. <laughs> Hi, Eva. I come from Soviet Union or ex-Soviet Union, and I come from Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is a Muslim part of Soviet Union, so not many people from Azerbaijan were drafted to war during the World War. But my grandfather died. He was a colonel. Uh, he was killed by Nazis later on in uh, after effect of the war. He was poisoned by the poisoned watermelon that was left behind by Germans. Anyway, so the, the story is very important for me, what you're telling me. And Azerbaijan had a lot of Jewish population, and we still have the largest mountain Jew population in all of Soviet Union. They're called Gorsky Jews. Anyway, we were always very welcoming toward refugees and even German refugees who ran. And all my best teachers at school, thanks to whom I'm here today, my English teacher, math teacher, history teacher, were always Jewish ladies because Jewish people were most highly educated, as, as you said, cultured. So when you, already a 15-year-old, like my son today, are being sent to the camp and your mother... Was there a sense of hope? Did you know for how long they lock you up? Did you hope you will come out? Or you just dumbed yourself down and worked and said that it's going to be a very short time, I'm going to come out healthy, it's a nightmare. Or you knew it's, it's over, I'm not going to make it. What made you go out, come out? <clears throat> well, when you were put on transport after arrest, you didn't really know where you were going. So there were some camps as well. As well as where labor camps where people were working, Jewish people as well. So, and but then there were camps as well like Treblinka in Poland, where the whole transport, whoever you were, um, any age, went straight to the gas chamber. You had no chance whatsoever. So we didn't know where we were going to send be sent. So, but in the train we still hope perhaps it will be a labor camp. But when we were sent to Auschwitz, we were starting to, because we knew people were guests there, we were afraid we might be killed at arrival. But when that didn't happen, so we were um, still amongst the living, we hoped perhaps the war was going to end. We still, you, you can't live if you have no hope because then you just die anyway. So you had to keep your hope going. Um, there were, of course, some people who just couldn't stand it any longer, the degradation, the hard work, the hunger, and wanted to commit suicide. 
but even that was not possible really. You had not a piece of lace, you had not a knife, you had nothing to commit suicide. The only thing what you could do was to throw yourself like against an electrified barbed wire, which I must say, I think I've seen three times people doing this. And they must have been very, very desperate because it was highly electrified and you saw the people bursting into flames and they were stuck stuck onto the wire and the terrible screams we heard. You can imagine how desperate these people must have been to do this. But you know, as long as there is life, I think there is hope. Here's a question from a student on my left. So, hi, yeah, I'm a student. Um, so we've talked a lot about Anne Frank and your brother and also about death camps. I was wondering if you could also tell us a bit about how you moved on from your experience after the war. After the war, how did you move on? What kept you going? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I say after the war, um, I felt actually more depressed than I was in the camp because in the camp I had to use all my strength and my will um, to, to survive. But afterwards, I thought life without my family is useless, you know. I was really, really depressed. And especially, I hated everybody. And, and that is what Otto told me, you know. If you hate, you become a miserable person. And the people you hate, they don't suffer from your hate. Because I hate all the Germans, and Germans didn't feel bad. Um, but I felt bad. And so he told me a lot, you know. He said, um, um, go out in the world, you will see there are some wonderful people around. And not everybody was bad. And it was true, you know, the people, the people who work in the resistance, who help people, who fought the Nazis, and ris risking their life, risking their life to keep us in hiding, to keep us safe. Um, there was a lot of good people as well, and you have to keep this in mind always. The world, even if things look very, very, very dark, it's not all bad. And you have to hold on to the good things. There's a student in the middle, please. Yeah. So uh, the liberation of Auschwitz happened nearly 75 years ago. So has your memory of your experience at the camp changed throughout the years, or is it still as strong? Um, no, I remember every, every little detail, um, but it doesn't hurt so much anymore, you know? Um, I spoke uh, um, some time ago in Germany, in Weimar. This was a capi uh, capital, the center of uh, Germany, where all the Goethe and Schiller, the poems were come, and lots of scientists. It was a very intellectual city, and that was the new government of Germany. And I spoke to in a castle and um, uh, told my story. And the next day, I got a letter from a woman who wrote to me. She was there with her daughter listening to my talk. And when they came back, um, they were still talking about what they've heard. And the daughter asked the mother, 15-year-old girl, um, what did grandpa do in the war? And the mother said, he was a Nazi, he killed many, many people, he fought in Russia, and um, he, he murdered many people in Russia, but as well on the way in Poland and things like that. And the daughter became very, very upset. She said, um, terrible, that is my family, and I don't want to know, and she wanted to run away. And they talked through the night, and the mother wrote in this letter to me. I explained to her, my father was a teacher before the war, but he was um, taken into the army, and then uh, somehow he became a Nazi. And um, when he came back, uh, he couldn't anymore function properly. He occupied himself only with philosophy and, um, and religion. And I had no father, he never smiled at me, he never played with me. And um, 
she said it was a terrible experience, but they thanked me that it had come in the open. She had never dared to speak to her husband, or she had a son as well, um, who her father was. But now it's in the open, and she hopes that her children will understand now. And I was thinking a long time before I replied to her, and I wrote to her, you know, I think your father was not a bad person. He was just forced to do things which he really didn't want to do. And this is really, I think, what happened with the German population. You know, um, they were singing and they were pretending it was a good thing. They were telling that it was all the fault of the Jews they had lost the First World War. And they started to believe things. Propaganda is a very, very important media to influence people. And I met as well a man from Vietnam who came to me once after my talk. And um, he, I didn't know he was Vietnam and he, I was crying. And I said, are you Jewish? Have you lost family? He said, no, I was a soldier in Vietnam. And I have nightmares. I did terrible things. I burned villages with Vietnamese children. But it was an order, I had to do that. And you know, so I realized uh, not all those people who did those terrible times were evil, but it was the propaganda and the sort of, it was the thing that you have to do and people followed. And so we have to reconsider. And after that day, I realized I don't hate the German people. I hate the Nazis who were planning the killing of six million Jews. But the people who were dragged along to do it, I have actually forgiven. And after I've forgiven, I felt a much happier person. Okay, that's a question. That was here. a long explanation, but I think it was important. Thank you for your question. There's a question there, and then I have some questions from, we have another about 100 people at the Miller Theater up upstairs. So I'm going to ask some of the questions. After this one, you have to wait your turn. I know somebody, you have, some of you have been keep raising your hands. Don't worry. Uh, unless time's up before your turn, uh, there's two hands at the back and then the lady on the sixth row, okay? The, gen uh, the young gentleman here. Shortly after the war ended and when you were liberated, how, were, how did people treat you? Who dif what, did they treat you differently or did you treat you with respect or were they treating you hostilely or what type um, of No, they were definitely not hostile, but they didn't really want to know. They were not interested to hear. They said, we all suffered, so you suffered perhaps a bit more than we, but they were not interested. So they but were... I must say, in Poland, for instance, when Jewish people came back, not that many, unfortunately, and um, other people had moved into their homes and had taken over all their possessions, and they wanted their homes back, they were murdered. So there was, I don't know if you know about that. After? After the war, when um, some were partisans, had fought with the Russians, and they came back to claim their property, they were murdered. There were a lot of murders in Poland. By? For, by, by Polish people, it's by uh, it's murdering survivors. Right. OK, here's a question from uh, the students upstairs. What kind of work can the society, especially the young people, do to reduce discrimination? What can young people do to discriminate, to minimize discrimination? Well, I think that is a question to the young people here. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK, uh, we'll go on. Uh, there's two questions at the back. Yeah. So I've been to Auschwitz the past summer. So they charge for toilets. They sell like souvenirs. They're like seemingly trying to profit from this kind of dark history. So what are your views on this kind of dark tourism? Um, they charge you for everything in Auschwitz. What do you think? Do you think they should charge you to uh, see the place and uh, use the toilet and what have you there? Um, well, you know, it's a, it's a very, very expensive thing to keep those camps going. They have thousands of employees, guides. Um, they have to maintain the thing. Um, it has become, I mean, I don't like, I've been back. I never wanted to go back. But I went three times back 
once with a Dutch television, then with a German television, and the last time with a Japanese television group. And each time I found it um, less what it really used to be. And um, it has become a tourist place. Um, um, people take photos, people smile and take, oh, let's take this or that and stand there and they want to fail. And then they go and show slide at home. I've been to this camp and that camp. One man said, I've already been to this camp and this camp and this camp. I still have to do this at this camp. You know, it's, it's, I don't like this idea. On the other hand, people who do go there, it makes a big impression to them. And perhaps it is necessary. But it costs a lot of money to maintain it. So, of course, the Polish government doesn't want to pay for that. So they have to raise some money for the cost. Young Lee, can I interrupt relatively? Yeah, please. Uh, so there, I've seen you in your interview that once you mentioned how, for example, the book Anthrax, it, it omits the gory details and it talks about the, the flares and all the relationships and all that. Are you afraid of one day without the living history elements of talking about the Holocaust that eventually these true accounts of history increasingly become desensitized and that people forget the true tragicness of it? Um, yes, it I mean, um, you know, unfortunately, there will be other events happening which pe might be tragic, which people will remember. And um, so, yeah, I mean, the Jewish people remember the whole history. We celebrate uh, our time celebrate. Remember our time in Egypt. We remember our time in Babylon when we were persecuted. We remember what happened in, in England when Jewish people were persecuted. So we do remember our things. But the general public, I think, will move on. The lady student on the sixth row, third from the middle. Uh, yeah, I was wondering how you met your husband and uh, what role he played in like your path of recovery? Um, um, when I finished school, I went to, I was going to be a photographer and I went to England to, um, to become an apprentice in a, in a uh, photographic studio. And um, I lived in a little boarding house where that came a young man who had come from uh, uh, Israel to study economics. And you know, at that time, the English people didn't like foreigners. Um, so we couldn't really make friends with English people. So we were friendly together. We were both foreigners. And um, so we went for long walks, but we didn't tell each other who we really were. I told him I was Dutch, which I wasn't. He told me he was Israeli, which he wasn't. And we didn't talk about what had happened to our lives. And, um, but we liked each other and he asked me to marry him, which I eventually did. And only then did we really tell who we really were. So we were married for 63 years, but we had taken a big gamble because we didn't really know each other. And you had three daughters. We have three daughters and five grandchildren now. Very good. Okay, the student here. All right, so since we're all students here, I'd just like to know how is school like after being liberated? How is school life yeah. after? Um, after I went back, um, again, you know, um, I went back to school. Um, I was behind three years of um, studies, but um, it was a very, my brother had been in the school um, when we came to Holland, and then of course we had to, Jewish children had to leave their school. But the headmaster was very um, was a resistance worker as well. He was actually arrested, and he took in all the children who had been in the war as well from Indonesia. Indonesia was a Dutch colony, and many many people had fled after the war from there and came to live in Holland. So they were sort of refugees as well, and um, he took in all those children. And we had special lessons to be able to catch up. But we didn't talk to each other what we had, who we were, where we had been, what has happened in the past. There was no talk about it. 
because when I donated the paintings from my brother to the Resistance Museum, there were some people who had come who were with me at school. The Resistance Museum found people who had survived. And we talked to them, and it turned out that some were survivors from camps. And I said, what, you have been in camp? I never knew. He, when I told him I'd been in Auschwitz, he said, oh, I never knew you had been in Auschwitz. We were school friends, but we didn't talk about our past. The, the, the lady student there, and then on the, the left afterwards, and then the gentleman who was obviously not a student, but it's okay. Yeah, young lady, <laughs> please. You mentioned how many people stopped looking out for each other um, in the camps. Do you think this sparked conflict between people? It, it Does it spark conflict between the camp mates? You didn't. You don't. You stop caring for each other. No, you know we were we were much too busy just to stay alive. Um, when we came back from our work, we were too tired. There was no conversation. The only thing we did talk about was was food, what we would eat if ever we got out again. You know, we were completely obsessed with food. Um, but otherwise, there was really, there were, of course, orthodox, really orthodox Jewish people who prayed all the time. But, I mean, we did pray to God to stop this, but he didn't. So that's why the not so um, uh, religious people came out, like me, I came out of the camp a definitely unbeliever. I didn't believe, I said, uh, we were supposed to be God's chosen people. And even when I go now to synagogue, we thank the whole time God for saving us, for helping us, for making life possible for us. And I say, um, I pray and I say under my breath, no, that's not true. You didn't save us. You didn't help us. You didn't look after us. But the prayers are thanking all the time how God looks after us. And I say, no, you didn't. The young lady over here and then the gentleman by the aisle. Um, when you found out that you were liberated and you were free, what was, as a teenager, what was the first thing you wanted to do? Was it to eat well? Was it to sleep well? Was it to... Eat, eat, eat. <laughs> we were really, if you starve for so long, you know, food was the most important thing. Just eat anything. The gentleman. Thank you, Ms. Schloss, for your very interesting talk. Um, in fact, my question is from my uh, daughter, who's in the Miller Theatre, uh, and she just emailed me the, the, the question. But uh, the question really was about: Did your uh, did did your religion? help you at all in the camps? And you've sort of answered that just recently, just in one or two of the last questions, but was there any comfort given to you by, by your religion? No, I'm afraid not, not at all, not at all. Right. But, you know, I wasn't really very religious, so I think Orthodox people, perhaps they accepted their faith, I don't know. Um, it's difficult, I think it's difficult. But there were Orthodox people who became completely unbelievers, and there were unbelievers who became religious after their experience. You know, I don't know. It, de it depended how how you felt about this terrible experience. Yes. But I certainly um, um, didn't help me. Right. Thank we you. Some, we have some questions from up upstairs again. What helped you survive Auschwitz? What helped you survive Auschwitz? My stubborn, stubbornness, I think. Your stubbornness. I did, yeah, I'm a Taurus, so uh, an ox to go with. They always, um, everybody said to me, you go with your head through the wall, um, and I do. You know, I don't give up anything. So does it mean that young people should develop that characteristic? Um, yeah, I think it helped me. But it's, it's not always so pleasant, I suppose. Some people don't like it. <laughs> but your husband obviously at least bore with it. Um, he, he, yes, he, he, he quite liked it. Good. So I, I make the decisions. I decided things. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK. It's just like my family. By the way, my <laughs> wife tried to come in here. I told her to come here. And she got here and saw the full. She couldn't find a seat, so she went home. Uh, <laughs> how did it feel when you saw those dying around you? 
you saw a lot of people die around yes, you. Of course, of course. What, Not what only through? did I see them, I had to take them out of the barrack bodies. You know, carry them out. Carry the, them the, out. The corpse. Yeah, yeah. What went through you? What, were you, what do you think? Or you didn't, you block it off? Well, you think, is that going to be me perhaps tomorrow? It's, it's horrible, it's horrible. And I had a lot of nightmares about this. We couldn't even close their eyes because their eyelids were frozen. Your eyelids were flo frozen. Wow. Well, there are two questions of the same nature. One is too personal. I don't want to ask that. The other one is, were there sexual abuse in the camps? Um, they say this Mengele um, did have uh, taken women and abused them. Sexually. That was a terrible doctor, the, very the, the most the one infamous. Who, who had just conducted the selections. And you had to be confronted by him once. Yeah, that is there are actually quite a few books about people who had to be had been raped by him and abused by him. Right. There's a question by the wall to the left. Um you mentioned uh correct me if I'm wrong. You mentioned that you were betrayed and then arrested. Can you tell us more about that? How were you betrayed? Who betrayed you? Um, it was a Dutch nurse who was a double agent. She pretended she was a member of the resistance, <coughs> but she really um, <coughs> worked for the Nazis. So it's a, a nurse. Okay. <coughs> Uh, sympathizing with the Nazis, and you got five guilders for every person you betrayed. And how many people did that nurse betray? Over 200. So so every, was... I just want to add something here. So, of course, we have this one time that we can speak with Eva, and there's so much in her story. In a period of two years, when she was hiding, she had to move to seven different places. So she was in seven different hiding places before she was ultimately arrested and taken to Auschwitz. I okay. just want to, um, about the food, which um, somebody asks there, um, when the Russians came and they left again, um, they, left, they had shot a horse. Um, you know, there were lots of horses, but the horse was shot and it was lying on the snow. And a Polish woman said to me, that was when we were really free. I mean, we could have gone, but of course we couldn't because we, were, we had nothing. Um, she said, get a knife from, from the kitchen from the Nazis, and we are going to um, cut this horse up, and we are going to eat it. And um, we did. We cut it open, and the, head, the Russian had it shot because it was pregnant. So we got, uh, there was a little horse in it. And um, that we didn't eat, but we ate the horse meat. Uh, not bad, not wonderfully cooked, but the bits in hot water, we ate that so hungry we were. Okay, I have another question here. What is your most profound memory of Anne Frank? Mm. But she was very, very uh, amusing. She was always wanted the center to be center of attention, and she was a big storyteller. Um, and she had to, um, and a big chatterbox. Very often she had to stand behind in school and write hundred lines. I'm not going to talk so much in class. <laughs> so a big chatterbox, very active, and um, and she always wanted to be the center. Um, an hour where we lived on the apartment, there were steps, and she always sat on front of the steps and tried to get a crowd of children around her, and she told her stories. So even when she was 12 years old, she was already, um, had already a vivid fantasy. Wow. Okay, here's a question. Is it more important to maintain peace, or can violence be justified as a means of fighting against injustice? Well, I don't know. Um, you have to try to get things which are wrong to negotiate in a, in a good way. 
negotiation is always better than uh, using arms or violence. There is a question from a gentleman at the back. Hi. Um, Hello. Uh, after you were liberated from Auschwitz, I'm pretty sure you were financially unstable. So did you have to work to support your family and what kind of um, occupation did you have? How do you, so, uh, you must be financially broke after the war. How did you support yourself? I suppose Otto, the father of uh, Anne Frank was still alive and that's your stepfather. Yeah, but Did he not, provide it for the family? No, not, not, I mean, he actually lost everything as well. Um, but um, we got back our apartment, which was not really our part, but just rented. But um, we had four rooms there, which um, my mother let the, uh, the bedroom where she slept with her husband to two ladies. And my mother cooked for them in the evening. And my mother took a job, so she had never worked before. That was quite funny. She worked in an office. She had never typed or anything, but she was a very intelligent woman. So she had to make uh, the bills, the accounts. And um, she came home every day with a big bag with paper, which she had spoiled, wrong typing. And she didn't dare to throw it away in the office because she would have been sacked. She wasted so much paper. So she brought it home and threw it away at home. But, you know, she just, been, there was chaos, you know. There was, um, the bosses didn't show, didn't look exactly what she was doing. So they didn't realize she was completely unexperienced as a secretary. I like some of the younger students, please. <clears throat> Um, uh, was there any profession you wanted to pursue before the Holocaust? And if so, did you pursue it after the Holocaust? Um, if there was any profession? Before uh, the camp, the death yeah, camp. Yeah. Did you have some idea what you want to do in life? I and wanted... did you try to do that after you got out of the death camp? Uh, I loved the flowers, the tulips. You know, Holland is very famous for the beautiful tulip fields. And I wanted to become a tulip planter, which um, is a family job. You know, you inherit it from your, from your parents and grandparents and so on. So that was just an idea. No, I never, I never did that, actually. The, the gentleman in front. Hi, thank you very much for the, um, the great presentation. Um, my, my question is a, is a bit esoteric. You uh, lived in many places. Um, I grew up. I was born in Odessa, but then I moved to L.A., lived in New Odessa, York. Odessa, Texas, or Odessa in uh, Europe? Ukraine. Ukraine. Very oh, large Odessa, Jewish yeah. population, there. yeah. Uh, and I've lived six years in Hong Kong, very international place. The young adults here are very representative of, of it. I grew up uh, with Muslim friends, black friends, Mexican friends, all, all kinds of people. And we grew up in an environment where we can openly talk about our uniqueness, which, makes our, which is our culture. And we could point it out, we could tease each other, we could make fun of each other. And we see a lot of comedians doing it. Um, and you know they do it on Netflix or they do it on various shows like HBO. Um, at what point when, you know, when race becomes a problem is it sometimes starts at a very small subconscious level. Joking becomes not joking and it turns into um, to racism. So at what point do you feel like we should appreciate our, each other's differences? Um, and at what point do you think it's not funny anymore and we should understand when to back down? Well, I, I can't understand why people have to be the same. I think people from different uh, countries, from different races, um, life is so much more interesting if we mix and accept each other. And um, the same with religion. You know, if you have different religions and uh, you exchange what is your belief and so on, I think that's the best thing, the wonderful. Um, and I really can't understand why people have to dislike each other and hate each other and kill each other if they are from a different background or from a different country. It's something I really can't understand. And um, I hope that eventually, I mean, now people travel so much more 
um, as I say, as a chat in Vienna, I'd never seen a black person. Now, um, in our apartment block, uh, half the people are from the from Africa, from India, from all over the world, and you don't even notice anymore that they have a different color. And um, we visit each other, and we speak to each other, and we take each other's food, we try that, and like it or not like it. But, um, you know, this is how the world should be. We are all human beings, all perhaps descended from monkeys, and, um, um, you know, we are one big family. Last two questions. We are already 30 minutes over time. Those two have been raising their hand all along. So those two, two uh, by the window, the last two, please. Yeah. Uh, so in World War II, uh, the Japanese set up also uh, concentration camps in China and murdered uh, a lot of Chinese. And uh, so far, the Japanese government haven't apologized or admit the fact that they murdered like a lot of Chinese in China. So uh, what's your view on this matter? Well, that is again a particular Japanese thing because their, um, um, their, is it the king, their emperor is like God. And if God said they should do something, that is law for them. That's why I think they think it's not necessary to apologize. But I think that's of course wrong because the empire is not God and they shouldn't have just done those terrible things and they should admit that they were guilty. But no, the Austrians, the Austrians were worse Nazis than the Germans and they say they were victims themselves, which is of course not true. So, you know, that is, the attitude should be changed and they should realize that if you have done something wrong, whoever told you to do it, that you should apologize for it. Last question. Yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering, because as Auschwitz was liberated by the Soviet Union and the Russians, but living in the West afterwards, there's a lot of tension with the Cold War and everything, and there's a lot of controversy around Stalin and the Soviets today. What was your opinion living in the West on the Soviet Union? as you were liberated, but there's obviously controversy surrounding it. What do you think about the Russians and the Soviet Union? They liberated you, but there's a lot of problem between the East and the, uh, between Russia and the rest of the Western world. What do you well, think? Um, well, I personally uh, defin definitely, 100% definitely owe my life to the Russians. And, um, <laughs> and, um, I traveled four months with the Russian, five months even, and I've been back three times in Russia, and um, the people are wonderful, wonderful people. Um, they love their country, they sacrifice their lives. There are some amazing stories about the, uh, the um, when, when St. Petersburg was at siege, um, many, many millions of people died, and they didn't give up, they didn't surrender. The same, the Battle of Stalingrad, there are some fantastic films. The leader, Stalin, was a war criminal. He was terrible, and, um, but he was a good general. I must say, when Stalingrad was um, surrounded by the Nazis, he suddenly had, uh, in the Ural, he had already a big, big army ready to help the people to liberate Stalingrad, uh, the, the city Stalingrad. And, um, so he was a good general, and if without the Russians, I think Europe would have been lost. I'm pretty sure of that. So um, communism, I think, was a good thing at the time for the Russians. Israel, the kibbutz, um, uh, how they did that, is as well a sort of um, communism. I think to build the country up, to be equal, to share everything is a good principle, but then you have to come back to a normal um, way of life, which Russia has done, but of course they still have a, it's not a communist country anymore, on the contrary. It's a very rich country with a lot of very, very rich millionaires who buy properties all over Europe, but um, I think the animosity of America against Russia is a very bad thing. You know, uh, <clears throat> Eva was in my, uh, I have a little desk over here, my office, and um, there was a picture of Putin. 
uh, and somebody you know, that's me. But anyway, and uh, Ava was very surprised to see Putin, and uh, and I was impressed what they have said, and that is, the, I forgot the Russian was what uh, was the people that liberated many of you, and so your thankfulness uh, should continue. And if if the Russian wouldn't have advanced so quickly, you know, many many more millions would have perished. Well, I hope that everyone got something here today. I'm sure you did. I think the common uh, humanity that is among us is something to be treasured. And also the uh, spirit of the humanity is something that should long live. So with that, I want to uh, thank Eva Schloss for being with us. Thank you for living till you are 90. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you will live until you are 100, if not more, yeah, and okay. come back again and again. Okay, okay, I'll do my best. you do your best, you yeah. promise me. Yeah, yeah. And since your brother uh, was an artist, we thought that we should give you a book of a Chinese artist. So oh, I hope wonderful. you will enjoy that. Well, huh? thank you, thank you very much.